Today is August 4th and we're going to be attempting to remove the engine and these are the steps for engine removal. And this is section B2 of the 1994 workshop manual that you can find online for free at pmx626.info. These are the steps that you have to follow in order. They're not going to lay out every single step for you such as labeling all of your vacuum hoses so that you know where everything goes back together. They already assume that you are going to do that or you're good enough so that you know where everything goes so that you don't have to do that. But for me, I always label. And I always put all these little nuts and bolts in a plastic bag. So it's gonna be plastic bag, masking tape, and a marker. So the first thing, splash shield. We gotta get off the, uh, both splash shields. And there's a left splash shield and a right splash shield. All right, I got the splash shield off. It's no big deal, it's just a couple screws. Splash shield drops right off. It's really a no brainer. Next, you take off your air scoop. And in this case, there, is, there isn't one. Then your filter box housing. And in this case, there is not one. This car does not have a battery hold down. By law, you're supposed to have a battery hold down. It can be a bungee cord going on over top of your battery, a uh, thick rubber. That's really not the spec but you can kind of, you could probably pass an inspection doing it that way. The stock system is to have two large screws, a factory hold down, and a, a large side plastic piece along with a stopper on the bottom to prevent the battery from even moving around. This battery is just sitting in here loose. There's absolutely nothing holding down this battery. I did not know that, so I'm gonna have to go to a junkyard and get a battery uh, stay from another 626. We will just pop this out. But I think just to give myself a little extra room, I'm just going to go ahead and remove the uh, the intake from the engine itself. It's not really necessary, but I kind of I'm kind of curious to see what kind of condition it is inside of that throttle body throat. And the clip on here is already broken, so that should just come right off. That looks good. Uh, this is the air resonator. You just leave that attached. Be careful not to be too rough with it because these accordions can split and crack. And I do actually want to remove this just to get a look on the underside of these accordions to make sure it's not split between the the ribs on the bottom side. Oh, come on. <clears throat> that has got a really strong detergent smell in it. Aerosol, like seafoam or uh, paint. It actually smells like paint, like aerosol paint. All right, next we're gonna get up the battery tray. And this whole tray just lifts right up. And keep these screws with your tray. And of course, obviously they're on the battery. So I'm just gonna set this next to the battery. I've been working on this for all of what, five minutes and I've already made a pretty good sized dent. So everything that's sticking out this far of the sidewall here has to come out. And that includes headlight relays, mounting bracket, mount, cruise control, charcoal canister and some various uh, brake and clutch lines. That transmission is about this wide and I want to lift it straight up out of here and the hood has to come off as well because I want to try and do this from the top and lift it straight out because this car is not mobile. It's not moving. I can't move it backward because it's almost up against the wall there. So I can't just drop the engine through and then roll the car back like I did with my swap. When I was dealing with my swap, I just dropped the transmission out and pushed it through the front, which you can do, but you're not gonna be able to get the entire engine. See how much higher that engine is than the transmission? I would have to jack the car up like three or four feet to get this entire engine assembly to move out the front. When it comes to uh, using the crane, I have to get it out from the top. It is possible to get it out from the top, but you have to disconnect a lot more. If you just wanna drop it through the bottom and pull it out the front, you can do that and you won't have to disconnect as much. There's more stuff in the way to raise it out than to drop it down. And we're gonna be doing it the hard way this time. We need to go up and out. Disconnecting some of this stuff, labeling it as we go. I have no idea what this particular harness is for. Uh, it's just a general connector that goes from the fuse box to some harness that gets looped into this loom and then goes somewhere. Uh, so I have to uh, disconnect that, label both sides the same. So I'll probably label this side A and this side A so that both A's go together. And that's, I'm just going to repeat that step for everything I come across and label it sequentially. Should be okay. Okay, so I have both sides labeled A. Oh, there. But that's how you do it. And just keep doing it that way until you've got everything disconnected. And there's a lot to disconnect, so you'll be busy for a while doing that. All right. Next, I think I'm going to get these headlight relays out of the way. But we're going to get that bracket off and get that out of the way so we can get the transmission up past here. Cruise control bracket. 
wonder if that's going to be another 10. It is. Ow. Sweating again. It's freaking hot in here. And that whole thing should come off. Disconnect that. Label that. I'll just label this cruise. Alright, I'll just take this. And this is attached to a cable actuator. This cable here is the other cable that is on top of your gas pedal or accelerator pedal. If you have cruise control capability in your car, you will have another cable attached to your accelerator pedal. There will be two cables. One is your accelerator cable and the other is for cruise control. Okay, so I'll just kind of try and set that out of the way. The goal here is just to get everything out of this box. Anything here, because we want the engine to come up, so anything in the way has to go. <laughs> Which isn't even freaking bolted down. Why bolt down the fuel filter? <laughs> yeah, it's not even bolted down. I'll leave that connected for now. That'll be one of the last things, because I don't want open fuel lines in, in my garage any longer than I possibly have to. That'll be one of the last things I disconnect. I think the entire fuse box is going to have to come off. So I'm going to have to take off a lot of the, the wiring harness is going to have to come off completely. That's going to be a pain in the ass. All right, so next I'm going to come in and get the, uh, the starter post off. Get that loosened up. Starter cap has this rip, big round bulb here. It's the only thing like it in the entire car, so I don't need to label that. That's a no-brainer. One's a three-wire, one's a four-wire. The four wire is the one below the cat. So that's your downstream O2. Now we're under the passenger side front and here's your drain tube. So we're gonna drain all the coolant out. Now this is an aftermarket replacement because it has a, uh, a black hex and a small drain tube. The OEMs have a white cap and a large diameter tube that comes off of it along with a hose that comes down so it's easy to see that this radiator has been replaced before and i usually just get vice grips on there crack it loose a little bit and once it's loose you can unscrew it whoa I'm getting splished and splashed on coolant looks like a nice yellow and while that's draining, we're going to go up top and we're going to see if we can get a hold of those uh, radiator hose clamps and uh, start removing the radiator. Well, this has got a lot of oxidation right here. That looks like shit. Alright, well we got the upper radiator hose, now we gotta go get the lower radiator hose. The radiator hose on here is connected to the coolant rail, the same as the four cylinder, except it goes down to the lower port for the radiator. Then it has this large tube that comes right off the bottom here, and it tees into the lower radiator hose, and that is for air. Any air bubbles will travel upwards and get caught in here. And that's the whole purpose of this, is to remove air bubbles from your coolant. Does it work like it should? I have no idea. But the easy thing to do would be just to disconnect this hose from right there. And that's things barely even on there. And these are the little unexpected things that you find that are pain in the ass that end up taking you 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes longer than you thought it should simply because a hose clamp is pointing in the wrong direction than it should. So now I have to try and figure out a way to spin that hose clamp around so that I can get access to it. that's off. All right, now we have to follow our fan connectors. It's right there. Label both sides. Actually, I don't need to label that. That one's a no-brainer. Save my masking tape. And this one has the same exact connector on this side. There's a bolt here and a bolt down here. Just gonna have to take off the fan. The fan should just slide. I should have enough room to bring this guy straight up. Come on. Come on. Hey, now 
now we're getting some room in there, huh? Let's get this out. Let's let's see what this is. Just a uh, cut up rags from somebody's t-shirt. So this one's got a grommet on that side. It was broken, but it's there. Yeah, there's no grommet on this side. I have replacement grommets, good ones. That's not a problem. When you remove or install a radiator, it should have these large grommets here. And that's just as a vibration dampener for the radiator peg that sits in the bottom there. And that just gets plugged onto the peg that's on the bottom of the radiator. There's two pegs, one there, one over there. That's all there is to removing the radiator. You can see how slanted that engine is. We're gonna get that puppy sitting right. I'm gonna get all this stuff swapped in right. Basically, we're going to be redoing the swap. The reason that I waited an entire week was so that I wanted Andy to be here for this to help me. Just in case something goes wrong, I want somebody like Andy with Andy's strength to be here. You know, worst case scenario. All right, next, I'm going to go out the accelerator cable, which just unplugs from the back here. It's got four little tabs. The problem is this isn't the right bracket for this engine. So Andy zip-tied it right here so that this cable would stay in this track. Now I have to cut these off so that I can get the cable off. See, I should not be able to do it like that. Take that out, and there's your accelerator cable. That's all done, just set that aside. The 9697, it has an external crankshaft position sensor, so that's what I've labeled here, CKP. You need that out of the way so that you can get to your adjuster bolt for your drive belt. It's the same exact concept. This bracket here is the same exact concept for the other belt, except you have to get at it from the bottom. So here we're just gonna do this one from the top. It's a lot easier to go down below to check the tension than to try and stick your hands through here. This is the belt that we were loosening from the top adjuster bolt, and just slip it right off. This actually looks like a fairly decent belt. It's not in that bad a shape. It's actually pretty good. This is uh, probably a new belt that they put on when they bought the vehicle. As long as that lettering is still on there and it looks good, uh, that's a tip that I picked up from Brian's Mobile, because uh, that lettering will wear down. Uh, and this lettering still looks fairly brand new, so I would say within 20,000 miles. So this belt has still got a long life ahead of it. Now the other belt, I could take one look at that sucker and know that they did not replace that back accessory belt. So you loosen that one right here. It's the same exact kind of bracket and adjuster bolt, except you go down to loosen it, and that pulls this pulley down, loosens belt tension. Barely. Okay. Put that belt off, just as I suspected. That belt is fairly close to snapping. Got these cracks all over this thing. So this belt is done. So no lettering and cracks means time to replace the belt. Get new belts, Chloe. And while you're under here, spin all your pulleys. Well, that one spins forever in a day. Well, that sucker spins freely. And it's got some wobble. So, I don't like that. And it's also, I don't know if you can see this right here. This spot has got a chip. Actually, actually this looks like plastic. So right here, I don't know how well you can see that. That spot right there is bent down. And it's not a big deal. Not really. But this pulley right here, but right here you can see that is all chipped away on that pulley. And there's another chip. And this is just jagged. Because this is the back of the engine. So when they set the engine down, it obviously laid. Where is that? It laid from here going across that way. So these two were on the face of the ground whenever this engine was taken out and uh, chipped the crap out of that pulley doing so. So that's going to cause an imbalance in the pulley. This one not so much. It's not really that big of a deal because this is just uh, I think they would call that an underdrive pulley. That bearing's got some clicking in it. So that's going to be some noise. 